Hello and welcome to the industry analysis for the management case study of February 2018. Uh, in this analysis, we're going to be looking at the real world industry and the idea is that we will be able to use some examples and some uh, insights from the real world industry to shed light on the pre-seen case and to try and anticipate some of the issues that might uh, arise in the case study exam in February. Now before I actually get into the industry analysis itself, uh, there is a question which is raised by the pre-scene. If you've already read the pre-scene, you realise that in some ways there are two aspects to uh, the industry question in this case. And the question is whether you should focus uh, from an industry perspective on uh, the oil industry, which is the broader industry within which you are working in this pre-scene, or the FOSSC. Uh, industry, if it could be even considered an industry. I think the answer to that question or a clue to the answer to that question can be found in the section on the mission and vision statements within the pre-scene itself. If you go to that section, you'll see uh, in two, po uh, two points, there is a kind of an indication or a hint that ultimately the FOSSC's focus is on how it can contribute to Norton's development uh, within the broader industry. You can see here, for example, FOSSC will enhance internal customers' performance by analyzing data with a view to identifying opportunities to increase revenues and or reduce costs. So that gives an indication that FOSSC is really uh, focused on, on uh, looking at the broader strategic context within which Norton is working. And of course, that means having some kind of knowledge or a basic understanding of the dynamics of the market within their, which they're working, which is of course, the oil industry. And there's another indication further on when you look at the strategy of the FOSSC in the question. You can see here they say, we will seek to understand Norton's evolving needs and then through our commitment to quality and excellence, we aim to exceed expectations. So, uh, and they also talk about business by developing as Norton expands underneath. So there is that sense in which that this FOSSC is very uh, committed to uh, Norton's needs and Norton's uh, growth and of course, in order to be able to uh, give advice on opportunities to increase revenues and reduce costs, uh, that will require some understanding of the basic environment within which they're working. And it's for that reason that we're going to focus here on the broader oil industry within which Norton is working because FOSSC ultimately is serving the needs of Norton. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what we'll be covering in this industry analysis. Now, the oil industry is an, an enormous industry and one of the most important, if not the most important industry in the world from an economic point of view and indeed from a social and political point of view as well. It's incredibly consequential. It's also really, really interesting and you could spend years researching this industry. Unfortunately, we only have around an hour. So what I've tried to do is to look at the most important and the most interesting aspects and to kind of distill them for you here uh, in order to give you the, the most important insights regarding uh, this industry from the perspective of the pre-scene. So the first part, we'll look at industry trends. We'll be looking at oil prices, historical and more recent trends in that respect. We'll be looking at uh, the production uh, levels of oil over recent years, uh, the reserves that have been established, and we'll be considering issues pertaining to profits. And from there, then, the profits issue will lead us into a consideration of the forces, both economic and political, that are influencing this industry. We'll be looking in particular at OPEC, an incredibly important organization within this industry, the geopolitics uh, of this uh, area and how that really it plays into things like prices and profitability and investment decisions. And also, uh, we'll be looking at per barrel costs and comparative costs of actually extracting oil in different regions. That is a very, very important factor within this industry. Then we'll be looking at the broader structure. Uh, we'll be looking at what are called the super majors. I'll be explaining what they are. Uh, the NOCs, I'll also explain what they are and, and the compar comparison between NOCs and super majors in, in terms of their importance uh, within the industry. And also there's some terminology which is uh, often used uh, in the oil industry, which you'll need to familiarize yourself with this upstream downstream uh, distinction and indeed there's a midstream as well that we have to understand so I'll be explaining those terms in more detail in that section. From there then we're going to move on to threats and controversies. There are plenty, uh, almost too many to name. I focused on what I take to be the most important and most uh, uh, recent uh, in terms of public, uh, public awareness, most recent threats and controversies which have uh, faced this industry. 
and then we'll uh, conclude there. Okay, so let's begin with the industry trends. We're looking at oil prices since January 2013. You can see there's been quite substantial changes in the last five to six years. Around 2013-2014, uh, oil prices were quite high by historical standards, uh, but then suddenly uh, quite drastically dropped from January for around, around the middle of 2014 uh, to January 2015 there. And they've uh, continued more or less in that vein until 2016. And since 2016, then there's been a slight rise in uh, oil prices and they continue to rise throughout 2017. So we'll be looking into the forces that have influenced those trends uh, in the next section. But I just wanted to make you aware of the recent trends in terms of oil prices, because of course this is a lot, uh, plays a big part on profitability and revenues. Global production and consumption, you can see, have been steadily rising since 2011, and that has been the historical trend as well. And as, uh, as production rises, uh, so too does consumption. Unsurprisingly, those two go hand in hand, and there's uh, no real sign of that slowing down as the world economy continues to grow. Uh, oil is, of course, the fuel for the growth of the world economy, so uh, one can expect that they will be closely aligned. Now, reserves, this is going to be an interesting uh, issue, which we'll come back to uh, at the end of the presentation. You can see here, though, that global proven reserves uh, have been steadily rising as well since the 1980s. And indeed, before that, there's been a constant historical trend of more and more oil reserves uh, being discovered, uh, proven reserves. And of course, there is an open question of how much more is left. We'll be coming back to that uh, at the end. But it does seem to be the case that we're getting better and better and better at reaching and finding new reserves of oil uh, in, in different parts of the world. Now, profits. As I said, this is a really complicated issue within this industry. Just to give you an indication of where things have been going recently, this is from April 28, 2017. You can see here a surging Chevron Exxon profits signal the oil industry turnaround. That is from the price lows that have occurred over the last three to four years. And they say that rising crude oil prices helped Chevron Corp and Exxon Mobil Corp easily beat analysts' quarterly profit expectations on Friday, setting an upbeat tone as the two companies press ahead with shale oil expansions. We'll be coming back to the shale oil issue uh, in a few moments. Very important one, from the, especially from the perspective of US uh, companies. So it seems that profits uh, are on the rise for these major uh, private uh, oil producers, but it's not a, a very simple picture when it comes to considering profits and revenues within this industry for very many reasons, and we're going to be looking at some of those reasons now. One organization uh, which you cannot afford to uh, leave out when you're talking about the oil industry is, of course, OPEC. It was founded in 1960, and OPEC is an organization of uh, petroleum-producing nations, with major uh, access to oil or access to major oil reserves you can see here it's qatar iran ecuador venezuela united arab emirates iraq libya kuwait algeria saudi arabia nigeria and angola so it's primarily middle east african and south american nations formed this alliance back in 1960 there have been various members uh, coming in and out but more or less it has been a cross section of middle east african and south american nations that have been uh, involved in this alliance so the question then, of course, is why was OPEC formed in 1960? Well, let's just start with the structure first uh, and in terms of their access to reserves. The 14 countries accounted for an estimated 44% of global oil production and 73% of the world's proven oil reserves. That's in 2016, giving OPEC a major influence on global oil prices that were previously determined largely by American-dominated multinational oil companies. We'll be coming back to that as well uh, when we talk about the super majors. So generally taken as a textbook case of a cartel, there is some debate as to its efficacy in manipulating prices. In, certainly in the recent years, there have been questions rising as to whether or not OPEC is really a sustainable alliance in the face of recent developments. But certainly, uh, historically, it has been taken as a textbook case of a cartel of a group that has uh, come together, a powerful group within a market, to manipulate prices through uh, um, collusion and through uh, these periodic agreements, for example, to uh, change their production output in an attempt to uh, manipulate the price, uh, to do so in a way that maximizes the profits of the group or in a way that harms the profits of competitors. So OPEC's stated mission is to coordinate and unify the petroleum policies of its member countries and ensure the stabilization of oil markets. Now, one would probably have to take this statement with a pinch of salt, 
Uh, but uh, at least uh, on the surface, that's their commitment is to stabilize oil markets and oil prices uh, and to guard against severe drops and increases in the price and to try and gain some stability. Of course, a cartel uh, generally is taken to be a much more self-serving uh, uh, entity than that. And generally, cartels are considered to be working in their own self-interest and don't really care about the broader context. But at least their mission statement is one of ensuring stabilization of oil markets across the globe. So the question then is whether or not they've actually succeeded in doing so. Well, let's look at the historical record when it comes to oil prices. This is the year that OPEC was founded. And if you're just looking at the graph after uh, OPEC's foundation, one would have to come to the conclusion that they haven't done a very good job of doing what they claimed they were trying to do, which is to stabilize the oil markets. Since 1960s, the oil markets have been incredibly volatile. You can see here, there's just been constants up, ups and downs and changes in the price year on year compared to the, what came before. This has been an unprecedented uh, period of oil market instability and volatility. You can see here, there was the 1973 oil crisis. This was the first major disruption since OPEC's founding. Uh, and that was uh, that, that happened after the Yom Kippur War. And there are several reasons for this, but put simply, uh, the OPEC countries uh, decided to impose uh, uh, something like an oil embargo on the rest of the world in response to the Yom Kippur War. And this, of course, caused prices to shot up as there were huge shortages. And uh, this was uh, obviously politically motivated. And that's one of the concerns that people have about OPEC and have long had about OPEC is that it was primarily a politically motivated rather than an economically motivated alliance that these countries were using their uh, relative economic power in terms of their access to the majority of oil reserves in the world to uh, force other countries to fall into line when they were perceived to be doing something that these countries did not agree with or did not like. And this was really the first major case of that happening. And indeed, it did demonstrate uh, considerable power on the part of OPEC to uh, impose pain, at least short-term pain, on the international economy. Uh, sh prices shot up and this caused severe disruption in Western economies especially. Uh, as you can see, the price continued to climb throughout the 1970s into the uh, early 1980s where it peaked. Uh, so we can see there another oil crisis occurred in 1979. Uh, and then after that, it began to decline, uh, especially as producers in the United States and the, the, the so-called super majors, the private oil companies, uh, increased their output and their production and this put some downward pressure on prices. Then again, in the early 90s, around the time of the Gulf War, there was another uh, price spike as there was disruption in the Middle East uh, uh, due to uh, that crisis, due to that conflict, and that restricted the supply of oil. And of course, that puts upward pressure on prices again. Then we had the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s, and demand dropped significantly at that point, and it caused a corresponding drop in the price of oil. Then it recovered somewhat uh, up to the 2000 mark and again a drop in the early 2000s, primarily as a reaction to uh, September 11th. And then it continued to rise throughout the uh, middle of the decade as the world economy began to boom. And of course, unsurprisingly, as you can see there, towards the end of that decade, 2008, the global financial crisis set in. And of course, that put a huge depressing and very rapid and sudden decrease on the price uh, as demand plummeted. Since then, of course, it's recovered somewhat, uh, as you can see, um, back to something like the middle of the decade uh, prices that we saw and even above. But since then, uh, and we'll look at this in more detail in the next few slides, there's been a, another drop, a con really considerable drop in the last few years, some, but returned to something like more normal historical levels of prices for oil. Uh, but relatively speaking, compared to say the last 15 to 20 years, uh, this has been one of the lowest periods uh, in terms of oil prices and so we have to look at what forces are driving that because that's very important from the point of view of a company like Norton in terms of their uh, strategy for the coming years. But overall the lesson here is that it's really a combination of OPEC and uh, what's called what are called exogenous factors that are driving uh, this volatility over the last 40 to 50 years. Certainly OPEC uh, has uh, it had some impact on this volatility, especially in terms of their reaction to political conflicts or geopolitical tensions, 
trying to manipulate the price in an effort to in, exert some kind of political influence. That's certainly been part of the story. But of course, there are other aspects which are not really under the control of OPEC. So, for example, when you see these uh, economic crises, which are caused by other factors, this has a downward pressure on the price because demand, of course, plummets. And when demand plummets, the price will fall too. Or, for example, wars and conflicts that are not necessarily... Uh, uh, that, that OPEC does not necessarily react against. There might be internal conflicts within, for example, the Middle East, uh, which can actually restrict supply um, simply due to the disruption that's caused. So it's really a combination of uh, geopolitical conflict and a combination of the force that OPEC exerts in terms of their ability to uh, restrict production and output in an effort to punish, for example, uh, people who are perceived to be behaving irresponsibly from a political point of view, um, and certainly also another motivation from OPEC's perspective is uh, when they want to raise prices in order to uh, achieve maximal profits. Now, as we see, that landscape has changed somewhat, especially in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, for reasons that we'll go into soon. You can see here, this is the OPEC uh, production of oil versus non-OPEC uh, uh, production. Non-OPEC production includes both national oil companies outside of uh, the OPEC alliance and private companies as well. You can see since 1970, uh, the non-OPEC production has pretty much constantly risen. It's been fairly steady and it's been uh, uh, largely unaffected uh, by political motivations. And you can see then that the OPEC production has been comparatively very volatile up and down. And that's a reflection of OPEC's uh, attempts in various periods to manipulate prices through production uh, increases, radical production increases and radical production decreases. Uh, and that characterizes the OPEC alliance's uh, uh, production uh, schedule, much more so than non-OPEC, which where non-OPEC more or less tracks global growth. And that's unsurprising as demand for oil goes up, production tends to go up as well. So a very interesting dynamic here and a really, really complicated picture uh, compared to other industries considering OPEC's influence. Now, by 2017, things had somewhat changed in terms of oil reserves, especially in the last five years, the United States has really jumped ahead in terms of its access to proven reserves. And it's now top of the charts, uh, according to this latest uh, uh, study. This is from uh, Rice That Energy, the source. Saudi Arabia, then you can see is third. But it's interesting to note that in this top 10, quite a number of them are non-OPEC countries. You can see United States, Russia, Canada, Mexico, and China. So it's split 50-50 in terms of OPEC versus non-OPEC uh, countries with uh, the access to the most proven reserves in the world. That could have serious political and economic consequences going forward, as we'll see. But the really important point to bear in mind here is that Saudi Arabia and indeed many of the Middle Eastern countries that are part of the OPEC alliance still win when it comes to costs of production. You can see here, this is the United States uh, costs per barrel. This is for shale, which we're going to come back to and discuss and explain in a little bit more detail uh, soon. But for US shale uh, oil extraction, the cost per barrel is quite substantial when we look at it compared to, for example, the likes of Saudi Arabia. You have taxes at $6.42 per barrel, administrative and transportation costs at $3.52, production costs at $5.85, and then capital spending at $7.56. Let's compare that then with Saudi Arabia. As you can see visually, off, right off the bat, it's much lower. Gross taxes at $0. That's a really important uh, comparative cost saving there. Administrative and transportation costs, again, comparatively low, two forty nine. dollars Production costs, $3 only, and capital spending, a mere three fifty. dollars when you compare that with the previous $7.56. So the question then is, why is Saudi Arabia so low when it comes to cost per barrel? And the answer is pretty simple. The reason is because the oil reserves and the oil wells uh, that are uh, prevalent in these regions in the Middle East, in Iran, in Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, these reserves are very close to the ground compared to uh, the reserves in other parts of the world and therefore they're very easy to access and therefore it requires much less capital to actually uh, drill and successfully uh, access this oil. So it's essentially these oil wells are just like, it's like they're sitting uh, a few hundred meters above uh, oil and that's an incredible, uh, an incredible advantage from an economic point of view. And that's why the Middle East is so uh, um, is so lucrative from the point of view of oil producers. 
You can see here, just looking at the global uh, comparisons, uh, the Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran and Iraq are way down compared to the other countries in terms of cost per barrel, and that's what gives them their uh, economic advantage. Uh, US non-shale, though, as you can see, ha is relatively cheap. You have Indonesia, Russia as well, where the uh, capital expense per, per barrel is quite cheap and quite low compared to the other countries. But if you look at something, uh, a country like the UK, for example, uh, where the cost per barrel is astronomically high compared to uh, Saudi Arabia, $44.33 as compared to uh, $8.98. So a really, really significant dis difference there. And that's that, that really gives you the key and the clue as to why the OPEC countries uh, still exert such influence. Uh, primarily the Middle Eastern uh, countries involved in OPEC is because of the cost per barrel is so low. And that's what gives them their uh, relative power when it comes to price manipulation, as we'll see. So let's look at the recent dynamics in terms of prices. We're zooming in here and focusing on the last 10 to 15 years. As we saw at 2008, there was a the radical and very, very sharp, sudden uh, drop in prices in response to the huge drop in demand globally, uh, unsurprising. Then there was the recovery uh, throughout the next five years or so, uh, where we had the price at in around the $100 per barrel mark. And since 2014, you can see there, there's been quite a substantial drop again to something like historical norms, um, but very, very, very substantial drops in the last year and a half. And the reasons for that are, uh, there's been a number uh, of reasons that have driven this drop. Primarily, it's been a huge increase in the relative supply uh, of oil throughout the world. Um, and that has been exacerbated by a number of factors. Firstly, there's been the Chinese slowdown in recent years. The economic growth that really um, spurred the recovery from 2008 to 2014 in terms of demand and the price for oil, that has since trailed off somewhat. And the, the economic growth year on year of China is slowing. And that's, of course, depressing demand, relatively speaking. Another factor is the, sh the surge in U.S. shale oil. Uh, and this has really put U.S. strategically in a, a powerful position from the point of view of energy economy. Uh, and they've, they're moving closer and closer to energy independence, which is obviously a really, really important uh, thing to achieve for a country if they can pull it off. And that has, again, uh, increased the supply of oil globally. And then that's put a downward pressure on the price. And then a third factor, which is really interesting, and we'll be looking at in a little bit more detail, OPEC has tried to respond to especially the US shale surge uh, by flooding the market with even more oil. And the logic here is very interesting. And let's have a look at this now. This is a report from Markets Insider, which uh, tried to analyze this situation. They say that for years, Saudi Arabia had been the undisputed world leader in the oil market for the reasons which we've already seen. However, thanks to advances in shale drilling technology, oil production in the US recovered from years of declines and at one point America overtook Saudi Arabia as the world's largest producer. In fact, shale drillers pumped out so much oil that the world became vastly oversupplied and again, China's relative economic slowdown has exacerbated that, which caused prices to crash and the Saudis didn't help matters. They chose to leverage their low costs into higher volumes to drive as many shale producers out of the market as it could. Now, this is really interesting. If you bear in mind the cost per barrel uh, that we mentioned before, the idea here is that because the Saudis have such flexibility in terms of, of generating profits, because their costs are so low, they can really afford to drop their prices quite radically and thereby undercut the US producers. And the idea was, at least their hope was, that in doing so, in flooding the market with their oil, they would be able to push the price so low that the U.S. shale uh, producers would not be able to sustain uh, sustain their profits uh, because their costs were too high and the prices would be too low. However, this didn't really work out. As we see here, it backfired because it forced shale producers to become much more efficient, which led to a significant reduction in costs. So that's the interesting fact is that over the last few years, especially, there's been a huge amount of research and investment in uh, shale, uh, shale uh, oil extraction, particularly with this new tech, well, not a new technology exactly, but a much more advanced version of the fracking or fracturing, uh, hydraulic fracturing te uh, technology that has allowed US uh, producers to access shale oil in unprecedented volumes. And so that has been uh, really, really important because the developments there have allowed them to cut costs in a way that, that, that insulates them from this pressure that's come from uh, places like Saudi Arabia, where they're trying to undercut uh, these U.S. shale producers. So that's again furthered the downward pressure pr price pressure dynamic. The U.S. shale manufacturers continue to uh, make uh, reductions in costs, 
and continue to be cost competitive when you take into account things like transport. So the idea is that the U.S. shale uh, oil producers are able to sustain the profits because uh, it's within the country and the transport costs and logistics involved in shipping and things like that uh, allows allows them to remain cost competitive because they don't have to uh, transport their, their oil as far. Whereas if they're importing oil, if the U.S. is importing oil from Saudi Arabia, even if the the uh, the sale price uh, in Saudi Arabia is much lower, there's still the transportation costs that have to be taken into account. When that is taken in, into account, it actually makes more sense for uh, uh, domestic uh, purchasers and consumers to buy the uh, oil and oil products from uh, U.S. shale producers. So that's been the dynamic in the previous la- in the last few years. The oil prices plummeted, and this has forced Saudi Arabia and OPEC to react. And this is what's currently happening. So there was a, something of a price rebound in 2017. As we saw, due to the shrinking financial reserves of the OPEC countries, they finally agreed to, new, to a new quota agreement in September 2016. So what they decided to do was uh, they agreed to a reduction of 1 million barrels per day alongside promised reductions from 11 non-member member nations. Now that's another interesting uh, development is because it's other other non-member nations have agreed to reduce their output and the idea here is that they too it's in some of their interests to try and raise the prices because it's gotten to a point now especially with the pressure from u.s shale producers where from any other uh, national international producers it has not become uh, profitable for them to continue producing at the per barrel price that's currently prevailing in the market and so they want to see as well uh, a spike in the price uh, and Therefore, they're agreeing also to restrict their output somewhat along with the OPEC countries. And of course, this has had an impact inevitably on the price. Uh, This has been recovering steadily through through 2017. Uh, And another very important development in this industry is that uh, one of the, in fact, the largest uh, oil producer in the world, which is a national oil company in Saudi Aramco, they are planning to make an initial public uh, offering very soon and it's going to be the biggest IPO in uh, history they're saying that it's uh, the most valuable uh, organization in the world and the re- the idea here is that at least the, the the word coming from within Saudi Arabia is that Saudi Arabia wants to diversify its economy it doesn't like the fact that it's become so dependent on oil on crude oil and it seems as if uh, they're kind of admitting defeat somewhat here because uh, as we saw in the last few years their attempts to manipulate prices have been somewhat limited and it seems especially this year uh, and with the agreement in 2016 they needed to call in the cooperation of non-OPEC members uh, and it was just coincidental that, that it, was not, it was actually in the non-OPEC uh, members interests to actually uh, reduce uh, output as well. The implication seems to be that it wouldn't have been sufficient for, uh, the, for, for uh, the OPEC countries just alone to restrict their output given the relative increase in power of the shale manufacturers uh, and uh, other non-OPEC producers. So really interesting dynamic there. We're seeing a shift away from the oil dependence of Saudi Arabia. They're looking to modernize their economy. They're looking to privatize more sectors. They're looking into things like uh, uh, high-tech industries. They're looking into diversifying the oil uh, uh, sector itself by focusing more on petrochemicals and petroleum products and not just on crude oil. They're also looking to uh, privatize more industries, make their uh, uh, economy more dynamic, and they want to really wean themselves off this oil dependence. And that's what's behind this uh, this IPO. They're trying to capitalize as much as possible in the short term on uh, the oil industry in an effort to reinvest that money and that capital then in other segments of the economy. Uh, and this seems to be an, a move away from their strategic reliance, ex- exclusive strategic reliance on uh, oil. Uh, and this may be an indication, this may be a signal that the global influence of OPEC is diminishing. Indeed, this is uh, one of the kind of uh, contradictions of cartels when you think about it from an economic point of view. Uh, and this has been seen historically with OPEC, is that it's very hard to actually guarantee cooperation amongst the members of the cartel. Because, of course, if, for example, the members of the cartel agree to restrict uh, production in an effort to push up prices, over uh, the medium term, it becomes in the self-interest of one of the members, of every member of the group, 
to try to uh, to increase their production and to violate the terms of the agreement because, of course, they'll stand to profit significantly if they can up their production, relatively speaking, and cash in on the higher per barrel uh, price of oil. So you had these constant uh, historical cases of members of OPEC um, deviating from the agreements and increasing or decreasing their production uh, in line with their own self-interest. And so it's very hard for these members to ensure uh, compliance uh, across the board with the agreements that they periodically come to. And that has been characteristic of the of the alliance since its inception. There have been moments where they've been able to do it and they've been able to coordinate their actions, but other moments where there's been... Uh, there's been deviations and there's been uh, members who have opted out, for example, unilaterally from the agree- agreement. So this re- development in Saudi Arabia uh, could be read as a kind of a, an, an, an admittance of defeat somewhat in terms of the strategic impact of OPEC, especially in recent years. So uh, a really important development there. This could really just completely change the landscape from the perspective of the oil industry.